Cost Segregation and Tangible Property Repair Regulations was a live webinar that was originally produced on Thursday, February 23, 2017. The presenters for this presentation were Mark Heath with McConley and Asbury and Gian Pazia with KBKG. Enjoy this webinar recap and visit us online at www.macpas.com for more information about our future events. And now uh, we're excited to have Gian with us today. We, uh, we use KBKG and GN to uh, assist us with our uh, client service, particularly in the area of uh, cost segregation and uh, the new property regs that were released a few years ago. One question I get from clients uh, sometimes is, why doesn't McConley and Asbury do this? And while we could, uh, we've chosen to, to instead partner with organizations where this is you know, one of only a few things that they do so that we can get the experts on board and we can make sure that our clients are getting the best possible tax answers for everything. So with that said, I'm going to uh, turn it over to Gian. I'm going to be jumping in here with questions from time to time to, uh, to try and be kind of a client representative to uh, think, think what clients are thinking and, uh, and ask questions that you might be able to ask or be wanting to ask. But as Tyler said, if you have any questions that you're not hearing, please uh, please send them to us. So I'll turn it over to Jan. And uh, Jan, maybe if you could just start off with telling us a little bit about KBKG, the background, and a little bit about yourself. Thanks, Mark. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to come speak. It's been a pleasure working with you and your clients over the last few years. Um, for those not familiar with KBKG, we've been around since 99 and we have offices across the US. Um, and we strictly focus on turnkey tax solutions uh, for businesses in, in CPA. So uh, dealing with cost segregation, uh, the repair versus capitalization regulations. Um, we also deal with the R&D credits and energy tax incentives. Um, so we've literally performed thousands of these types of projects over the years, resulting in hundreds of millions of dollars in benefits for our clients. And so our team is unique. We're, we're a mix of uh, engineers and tax specialists and attorneys from various disciplines. And it's really this combination of talent that allows us to be the very best at what we do. Um, so I'm one of the principal... Um, joining KBKG, I was with two of the big four CPA firms. So I'm going to start by talking about cost segregation. And really, you know, just to take this down to the basics, this is the process of breaking a building's cost down into individual components for tax depreciation purposes. And this is typically conducted uh, by an engineer with a construction-related background. This, uh, this can be done for properties that you acquire, uh, can be done for newly constructed property, and it can even be done just on remodel cost or you know, build-out improvement costs if they're large enough. And this can be done on any property that's been purchased in prior tax years. So we, we said we can go all the way back to 1987. And, um, and, and so this little you know, picture here shows, you know, typically for commercial properties, you're depreciating uh, that purchase price over a long 39 year life. And through this process of cost seg, we're trying to identify components that can be um, uh, depreciated and categorized as five, seven or 15 year uh, uh, tax lives. So the, the primary goal of this is to identify those components that have a shorter tax life, like I said, five, seven or 15 years. And by doing that, we're, we're depreciating them quicker. So we're taking our tax deductions earlier. So as long as we use those deductions and we need them, that means we're increasing cash flow. And by increasing cash flow, we're creating a time value of money benefit by having that cash flow now and not later. Yeah, one uh, one thing, Gene, if I can if I can just chime in there on that. Uh, this has historically been 
Well, it's, it's always going to be a temporary tax benefit, um, but the, the big driver has historically just been, like you said, uh, cash flow and time value of money. Uh, but if you've listened to some of our uh, other tax webinars, we've been jumping a lot on the idea of tax reform and how, particularly at the corporate level, if corporate income tax rates drop from 34, 35% down to 15 or 20%, like the current administration is talking about any, any deduction that we can take now, instead of next year, we'll be getting a permanent tax savings on that. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, definitely something we're recommending um, all clients and tax professionals to consider. Uh, cost seg is an opportunity to accelerate deductions into the current year. And if your rates are higher in the current year, um, you should use your deductions uh, when, when the rates are higher. Yeah, so, the, you know, the, the secondary goal of cost seg, you know, I said the primary goal is to identify the short life components. But the, there's a secondary goal, and that's to establish the depreciable tax value, not just for the um, components with a shorter life, but for every major building component that is in the building that could be replaced in the future. And so that would include things like uh, the windows, doors, the bathroom fixtures, the HVAC system, and so on, okay? Because when these components are replaced, even though they have a long 39-year tax life, your tax preparer is going to need this information to claim what we call a retirement loss deduction or a partial disposition deduction on the remaining uh, depreciation left on that component. And so cost seg studies uh, provide this information. Here in this example, uh, just to give you a flavor for the kinds of things that would get a shorter tax life, we see in this picture of a retail store, we see some track lighting, the electrical wiring for that. Um, any other decorative lights in the store would get a shorter tax life. Uh, we see wall paneling. Um, we see counters that are built in, some cabinets, maybe in the back rooms. Even flooring, certain flooring could be considered short life property. And then, of course, any electrical um, to power some of these uh, fixtures would get a shorter tax life. Uh, just to give you an idea, you know, Mark already mentioned that typically um, we're not, you know, we're not creating any additional deductions over the life of the property. It's the same amount of deductions, it's just when you take them. And so in this graph here, we see the red line, which just represents taking uh, for a $5 million office building straight line depreciation over 39 years. Now with a cost seg study in that same building, you'll see um, we're just getting a lot more deductions in the early years. And then around, I'd say year seven or eight, um, it flips and you start to get a little bit less deductions than you normally would have. So again, we're talking about just moving when the deductions are taken and Mark's right on point. If, if the rates are higher, you want to use your deductions in years where the rates are higher. Um, here's a case study of a $3 million retail building. So, of course, without the cost six study, you're depreciating this $3 million over 39 years. But with the cost six study, we've carved out $330,000 and put it into the five-year um, tax category, and then another $360,000 and put it into the 15-year category. So by doing that, in the first five years alone, we're getting $367,000 more deductions, which translates into a, a after-tax benefit uh, of about $126,000. So this can be a very powerful tax saving uh, tool. So, uh, you know, how does cost segregation work? What, what goes into these studies? 
Um, I already mentioned it's typically done by a cost segregation engineer. And we basically, we have to look at all of uh, the information available. So if there's any construction cost details available or contractor invoices out there, uh, we're going to want to see them. Uh, but if they're not available, that's okay. Uh, we'll look at other information. We'll look at building blueprints. So we'll want to uh, see the electrical blueprints or the mechanical and plumbing blueprints, architectural site plans, and so on. Um, again, if those are not available, that's okay. Uh, we can still inspect the facility, take measurements and photographs, and perform our engineering takeoffs uh, through site inspections. But at the end of the day, we're compiling all this information and providing um, you and your tax preparer a detailed report showing the value of each building component and how it should be treated for tax purposes. So, you know, I, I've been doing cost segregation for over 17 years, I deal with a lot of clients that own real estate. and. You know, cost segregation really has become one of the most common tax planning tools and powerful tools for anyone that owns real estate. And, you know, if you buy a building, you get a cost segregation study done, you would report the allocations, you know, on your, on your first uh, tax return that you own that property. But what makes cost seg so powerful is that you can actually time when you want to use your deductions. I mentioned this earlier, cost seg can be done any time after you buy a building and you do not have to amend any tax returns. Um, you would have to file what's called a Form 3115, which allows you to claim any missed deductions in the year you perform the study. So it's, it, it really is a, a very unique um, tool that allows tax preparers to plan when to use your deductions. So um, if you plan on maybe selling one of your other buildings in the future, or there's some other taxable event in the future, you might want to wait to do your cost seg study to take your deductions when you think you're going to be paying more tax. And Mark already mentioned, you know, if you think the tax rates are going down in the future, well, that could be a reason why you want to take your deductions now. So there's not a lot of opportunities out there like this, folks in the tax planning world, on when you actually get to choose and plan when to use your deductions. So this is what makes cost segregation pretty, uh, pretty useful. So I, I don't need to file an amended return on this, because that's one big thing we always hear, particularly for flow-through entities, that they don't the, the owners don't want to um, amend the business return and then have to go back and amend individual income tax returns, particularly if there are multiple owners who aren't involved in the business and live in another state and don't know what's going on. Um, so we don't need to file amended returns. Is that correct? That is correct. You, you do not need to. And yeah, that was something I think uh, somewhere between 10 and 15 years ago, they they made it easier by not requiring amended returns. Um, but absolutely, so you simply file this form 3115, you calculate the deductions that were missed, and then you simply claim all those deductions on the um, partnership, you know, current uh, year tax return, and then that flows through to the, the partners. Perfect, that makes life easier. Some other tax considerations related to a cost seg study. Um, the deductions that you generate with depreciation will reduce alternative minimum tax. Um, if you have, if you've built any buildings or improved any buildings in the last uh, 10 years or so, when, when bonus depreciation has been available, um, the items that we reclassify in a cost seg study are going to be eligible for bonus depreciation. So that only magnifies the benefits of doing the study. Uh, any unused deductions will carry forward. 
And then another consideration um, that you should discuss with your tax preparer are the passive activity rules. So if you are in a partnership and some of the investors are passive, um, you have to be cognizant that the deductions that are generated for a passive activity must be used against passive income. Some kind of rules of thumb, uh, good candidates to think about. So any building or improvement cost that's been incurred in the last 20 years or so um, could be a good cost seg candidate. Um, but there needs to be enough depreciable basis. Okay, so, you know, if you bought a building for a million dollars and maybe, you know, half of that was land, you, you know, that you'd only be left with about half a million dollars of, of building value. That probably isn't going to be enough. So you want to, you want at least $750,000 of what we call depreciable basis. So take out the land value if you got 750 or more uh, when you're looking at a freestanding building that, that could be a great candidate. Uh, there's also software out there um, for smaller residential properties like rental homes where you can, this can make a lot of sense you know, for, for rental homes with a basis as little as $150,000. And then if you're doing improvements to a building or have done improvements, um, we say that the rule of thumb is you want at least half a million dollars in improvement uh, before it kind of makes sense to, to go through this process. Um, the other thing to consider is um, it, it, you'll want to make sure you're planning to hold the building for, you know, at least a 10-year period. So we, we generally don't, I shouldn't have said at least the 10-year period. Um, cost egg is not recommended if you plan on flipping a property in less than three years, unless you do a 1031 exchange. So uh, you, you do want to at least plan on holding the property for some time. And then why, why is that, Jan? Yeah, so uh, the reason is because of what we call uh, depreciation recapture tax. And so when we're accelerating depreciation deductions into early years, when you sell the property, those accelerated deductions that you took are subject to a higher tax rate. Um, what we call ordinary tax rates versus the capital gains rates, which is typically lower. So without getting into too much detail, for those familiar with depreciation recapture, that's kind of the, the reason why um, there's, there's a three-year break-even point, if you will. So I would be, ta so if I'm sell accelerating depreciation deductions and getting deductions against ordinary income, but then if I have, but then if I sell it and I have to recapture all that as ordinary income, basically you're saying the benefit, the time value of money is lost unless you wait at least three years. Correct. Okay. Um, these next couple of slides are kind of a, an interesting tax planning strategy. Um, and, you know, it just kind of goes goes to the point of, you know, how valuable it might be to take your deductions as soon as you can. And, and this is a, a cost segregation estate planning strategy. So what's interesting is that when, you know, anybody passes away, we know that essentially the gains that the decedent uh, has built up are, are essentially forgiven. He's not having to pay this recapture tax that we just talked about with Mark. Um, so the beneficiary receives a step up to fair market value and gets to start depreciation all over again. This provides a pretty unique opportunity to create permanent tax deductions. Um, so I, you know, I like to make people aware, it's a, kind of a good example. Here we have a case study where somebody passes away in 2015, 
they had purchased an apartment building for a million dollars in 2008. So by the time that they passed away in 2015, um, you know, they took you know, some, you know, around $270,000 of depreciation on their apartment building, which left $728,000 of undepreciated basis left. We know that, you know, when when the beneficiaries get their step up to $2 million and, get, and start depreciation all over again, that, that's a great opportunity for cost tag. But there's an even better opportunity in this situation, and that's looking at the decedent's pre-stepped up uh, tax basis. Um, and, and you can basically conduct a cost sig study on that original 2008 purchase, okay, as long as you're doing this um, on the decedent's final tax return, um, you'll get to create a permanent tax deduction. So, so here's what, what happened. So uh, in the year the person died, you know, for the tax year that the person dies, we conduct a cost segregation study on their original 2008 acquisition, and we're we're taking uh, we're we're finding $174,000 of missed depreciation deduction. So we're doing this on the 2015 return. So we just lowered the tax basis to from 728 to 554. So we're getting all these deductions on the decedent's final tax return, and guess what? it all gets stepped up anyway. So this is a very uh, unique and important uh, situation to look for. Um, because if you're not going to take these deductions on that last tax return, um, you're basically giving them up. So it's kind of my favorite situation to apply a cost segregation to. Um, you know, I always like to kind of throw that one out there. That that principle, that same principle, I should go back a slide here, that same principle about when someone passes away and their beneficiary is getting a step up. You know, the, the same principle applies to any anybody that owns property that's older, that's elder, that's in their 70s, okay? If they haven't done a cost seg, could be advisable to do it if you, they're, you know, expected to pass the property along to their beneficiaries. You might as well take those deductions. They, they will not have any use to the elderly person if they're not going to live long enough to claim those deductions. So this really does apply to a whole a whole wide range of people and scenarios. It's not just like this is for, you know, big real estate developers or big manufacturing businesses that are building plants and office space all over the country. This can really be applied much more broadly than, than what we normally think of uh, traditional tax planning stuff. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's become, it's becoming more and more common um, just among, you know, like I said, mom and pop that have, you know, that, that buy an apartment building. You know, it, it really um, can have a, a big impact for various types of taxpayers, big or small. Sounds like it. So uh, I'm going to throw out a couple of developments and things to consider. Um, you know, if you know, there, there was a court case that came out a few years ago that where somebody tried to do a cost sig study um, and it was denied, but the reason it was denied was because the buyer and the seller had a, a written purchase and sale agreement that already allocated the value of their personal property. So, you know, if, if, if the sale was for $2 million, 
the buyer and seller said, yeah, we're getting a building, we're getting some personal property with this building, and we're going to say that the personal property is worth maybe $200,000. And maybe it was a bunch of uh, appliances, furnitures, and fixtures. The taxpayer did not intend, in this case, that the value that they allocated in the purchase agreement was really to cover all of the items that would be segregated in a cost seg study. But because of the way the contract was written, uh, the tax court said, you know what? You guys agreed to this allocation and therefore um, the cost seg study that you did afterwards really we can't we can't carve out any more because the way this was written bottom line folks is um if you have a sale a per, you know that that's hasn't closed yet just look at your purchase and sale agreement look to see if you guys are allocating any value to personal property in that agreement and if so talk to your tax advisor uh, before the deal closes, just to make sure that it's not going to, um, you know, I guess, negate or uh, shoot yourself in the foot if you want to do a cost fix study later. Would it, and uh, I'm not asking you to practice law here, but would it be a possibility in the purchase agreement to say, we're going to allocate this purchase price across this property based on whatever, but then put like a little rider in there that would say, but this is not intended to hold for tax uh, value allocation, or do you need, do you really need to dig into it before you set the purchase price allocation in the agreement? Yeah, no, you're right. Um, it, you don't need to, um, it, some, some suggested uh, language changes in the agreement could avoid a big kind of mistake. It doesn't have to be um, too technical, but you, you just don't want to write it the wrong way. Let me put it that way. And that's what happened in that tax case. So you're on the right track. Um, there's some you know, suggested language uh, changes or just making the attorneys aware that uh, you don't want it to kind of say this. Does that uh, make sense? I, yeah, yeah, I think so. It's yeah, it's you. You really got to stay ahead of this stuff, particularly on um, on you know asset sales or stock sales of a business with a three thirty eight H ten election to make sure that you're you're not like you said, locking yourself into something that you didn't realize you were locking yourself into. Right. Um, another development in the cost seg world is. In 2000, for 2016 and forward, um, they've created a new rule or category called Qualified Improvement Property. And uh, it's taxpayer friendly, so um, sure, sure. All right, so sorry about that. It looks like I had a glitch. Um, you know, if we're, if you're trying to determine how much a component is that's been removed from your building. Um, there are some other options other than cost segregation studies. Um, uh, the IRS allows what, what's called a discount approach using the producer price index. And we offer an online calculator called the KBKG Online Partial Disposition Calculator that allows you to uh, calculate the component value of any component in a building of any size. So you know, moving on to the tangible property regulations, this was kind of a big deal a couple of years ago for a lot of taxpayers that own real estate. Basically these new rules clarified when expenditures could be deducted as repair and maintenance versus when they had to be capitalized and depreciated. Um, these rules were generally taxpayer friendly and provided opportunities for taxpayers to claim a lot of missed uh, repair deductions from prior years. Um, just last month, the IRS uh, extended the timeline to claim missed repair deductions on 2016 tax returns. 
So if this isn't, you know, if you think you might have assets being depreciated on your depreciation schedules, you know, maybe you spent 10,000, 20,000 on HVAC or, you know, $30,000 on plumbing, these kinds of things might qualify as a repair deduction and you might be able to write them off. Um, there's also a safe harbor, some safe harbor rules for retail and restaurants um, that basically gives you shortcuts to determine if uh, certain costs in that industry can be expensed. So the crux of these regulations uh, you know, basically come down to a refined definition of what an improvement is. And the, the regs say that an improvement is an amount paid after you put a piece of property in service that is considered a betterment to the unit of property or adapts the unit of property to a new or different use, or it could be something that restores the unit of property. So to give you some examples, um, of what a betterment is. Um, the regulations say that asbestos removal from a bu building, removing the asbestos, those costs uh, don't make the building any better. They're not a betterment, they can be expensed. Um, another example in the regulations say that a taxpayer, uh, at the time they purchased an assisted living facility, they knew it needed work and right after they purchased it and for a period of two years while they operated the facility, uh, they paid for extensive repairs to bring the facility to a higher quality condition. So that was considered a betterment. Um, in this next example, cost to reconfigure and paint a retail store to update the look were not considered a betterment. Um, Replacing wooden shingles that are no longer available with comparable asphalt shingles that are even, that could be even stronger um, was not considered a better. Uh, so the, the next definition here of a restoration, just to make you guys give you guys an understanding of what these rules say. If you replace a major component or a substantial structural part of your building, that's considered a restoration and needs to be capitalized. Um, so basically that restoration rule has to be applied to major building components. So the first step is to identify what the major component of the building system is and then see if a significant portion of that was replaced. So my example here, we have an office building with an HVAC system which is comprised of three furnaces, three air conditioning units, and ductwork. So one of the furnaces breaks down and they replace it with a new furnace. In the regs, basically you know, we look at the, the three furnaces together and they perform a critical function for the HVAC system. So that makes them a major component. So now we look at whether a significant portion of that major component was removed. And since replacing only one out of three is not considered a significant portion of the major component, this is not a restoration and therefore can be expensed. Um, we have a couple of additional resources uh, that can help you figure out whether something is a repair and also even figure out if something is considered a major building component. So you'll see here we have what we call our decision tree to figure out if uh, something is a repair or an expense. Um, and we also have what we call our unit of property and major component chart. So if you're wondering if your, you know, something in your building is considered a major component, you can look to this chart and verify that.
Thank you. Thanks for sharing those, Jean. This is, you know, when you go through all the betterments, adaptations, unit of property, everything else, it's, it, you know, it, it boggles my mind that just when you think the, the tax code can't get any more complicated, they uh, go ahead then and make it more complicated. So that, I, I know we've used those charts internally here to help out clients. So that, that's a great resource. Thank you for sharing that. Very welcome. Um, you know, one of the other uh, one interesting parts of the tangible property regs is there is a safe harbor called the routine maintenance safe harbor. And it says, if you reasonably expect to perform some kind of activity more than once, within the class life of the asset, and it's, and it's a routine maintenance um, expense. And so when we're talking about buildings, um, they said um, the class life for the building that, that you're gonna use is a 10 year period. So if you expect to perform an activity more than once in a 10 year period for a building, um, you can just expense it. So, Here's an example. We have escalator handrails. We're replacing them every five years. That meets the safe harbor. Um, even if it may, if it fails the safe harbor, it can still be considered an expense. You just have to go through more steps uh, to get there to figure out if that's the case. But you know, along the lines of the safe harbor, you know, I, I found an interesting. Uh, application of it, and that's for parking lot resurfacing. So um, when we apply this safe harbor to somebody that's spending, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars in their retail uh, property to resurface the entire parking lot, you know, talking about two inches of new asphalt. Um, when we look at the class life of of, uh, of asphalt or a parking lot, it's 20 years. So when we apply this this safe harbor, are, do you expect to resurface a parking lot more than once in a 20 year period? So I've had clients that own like shopping centers that do expect to to replace it more than once because of, of the activity, or maybe a distribution facility where there's a lot of um, trucks uh, going back and forth and they do expect to do it more than once in a 20 year period, uh, you could expense it under this safe harbor. So there, there is some subjectivity there where, you know, if you're a landlord for an apartment building and you're not going to replace the, the asphalt unless every single one of your tenants is banging on your door telling you that it needs to be replaced versus a, you know, maybe some kind of storefront or something where the condition of their parking lot reflects on the condition of the property. There is some subjectivity there as to whether or not something would be uh, replaced more than once in the applicable time period. Is that right? Absolutely. It's, it's going to be different from industry to industry and taxpayer to taxpayer. And yeah, they talk about that in the rules that, okay. You know, they'll, they 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 will consider you know the application and the situation. So you know, as I kind of wind down my presentation, and I just want to talk about some of the or reiterate some of the kind of differences in caustic studies from ten years ago to today, and you know. You know, there's been a lot of different rules over the years, and COSEG used to be mostly just taking 39-year uh, values of buildings into these traditional tax buckets that we've talked about. But um, as the rules have gotten more and more complicated, these days when we do COSEG studies, um, we're breaking out a, into a lot more categories. We're looking for missed repairs, demolition expenses, things that have been retired, things that might qualify for tax credits because maybe they're ener renewable energy property. We're also looking at the different bonus depreciation rates and so on. And so um, this slide here kind of reiterates, you know, 
what kind of things to look for to see if you might be a good candidate. It also gives you a rule of thumb of how much it's generally going to be worth. So uh, for cost seg, we, we generally say the net present value of doing a study is going to be somewhere around 4 or 5% of the building's total value. So, so if the, we have a $2 million office building, um, the net present value of doing a study um, is going to be anywhere from sixty to one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. When we're talking about the repair versus capitalization regs, um, good candidates would be buildings that you've owned for more than a year and then went through renovations. You know, buildings that have enough tax basis. Uh, because if it goes through renovations, that typically means you're removing stuff from your building. Again, when you're removing stuff, you can claim these retirements or partial dispositions. Um, and then, you know, maybe you've owned a building for, you know, 40 years and it's fully depreciated. Okay. And you're, you're doing some updates to the building. Well, you know, the updates are significant, you know, north of $300,000 because of these new tangible property regs, there could be a lot of stuff in that 300 that you can expense instead of depreciate. So, um, you know, the additional year one deductions, uh, when we're looking at these uh, repair versus capitalization reviews could be anywhere from 15 to 40% of the new structural renovation costs. And uh, that concludes my presentation. Now, you know, I know we have a little bit of time to answer more questions. I want to thank Mark and McConley Asbury for uh, giving me the opportunity. It's like I said, it's a pleasure working with this firm. Uh, we work with a lot of CPA firms across the country, and you know, not all CPA firms are created equal. Uh, McConley and Asbury, I can say with certainty that they are one of the more forward-thinking, progressive CPA firms out there. And uh, if you're one of their clients, you know, you're in good hands. So thank you, Mark. Yeah, thank you very much, Gian. And uh, the check is in the mail for, the, for those comments. I'm just kidding, everyone. But, uh, but no, seriously, we've, we've had some great success with, with KBKG. The, the one that, that jumps to mind um, is uh, one of our clients. We they they did you know from our perspective a a decent job of properly allocating uh, purchases between five year, fifteen year, twenty, thirty nine year property. Um, and when they would open new stores, they would uh, they, they in my mind and in their mind thought they were aggressive on what they were expensing in terms of repairs and everything else. And, uh, and KBKG came in, and I, I, mean, I think the acceleration of the deductions was somewhere in the vicinity of like $100 million. And it was just, it was massive what they saved. And it, that would have been completely, not completely lost, because they would have gotten it, you know, eventually, but it would have been 20, 30 years down the road. Uh, so that's that's one of the, one, one of the, the great stories in this. And... Uh, outside of that, there's, you know, a couple dozen stories where w much smaller resort, much smaller results uh, by scale, but uh, but just uh, just the same in the tax savings to the client. So I would encourage everybody to to think about this uh, and see how it might apply. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, one one question we just got in here, I can see. Is, uh, is there a higher risk of IRS audit when accelerating deductions? Do you have any thoughts on that, Jan? Sure. Um, we get, I get this question a lot. Um, I, I'll say, I'll give a two-part answer. I, the first answer is, is if you're buying a building on, on a current year return, you know, you, you bought the building this year, if you do a cost seg study, in the year you buy the building, when you report it on your tax return, there is no um, indication 
or any way that the IRS could identify that you've had a cost sig study done. So especially on current year returns, I'd say the, the audit risk would be minimal. Um, when you're doing a study on a that, that you bought a building in a prior year, you will have to file this extra form, form 3115. So, but, but you know, it really doesn't necessarily increase the risk of uh, the IRS looking at your, your um, tax return. I've had clients claim, like you said, you know, 50 million, 100 million of missed depreciation deductions. And, you know, yes, they might get audited, but when they go through and they see that the work is done properly, there's no issues during the audit. Um, so I have had uh, some clients that, you know, they're, they've been paying tax, a lot of tax over the years. All of a sudden they do one of these studies okay, now they are, they just wiped out all their tax, and I don't know, maybe the IRS's computer said, wait a minute, let's, let's look at this one because they were paying a lot of tax for 10 years straight. All of a sudden, they're not paying tax. Let's, let's take a look. Um, I, I probably would say one out of every thousand studies we do um, get actually get looked at in detail. So that's kind of the audit rate. Um, but, you know, I... I you guys have some experience with this too, Mark, so your, your opinion counts. Um, I, I, I don't want to sound like, uh, you know, promoting cost segregation, but it becomes so common and it's been around so, such a long time that it's really not a controversial area with the IRS, especially because it's a timing issue. The IRS tends to not care about when you take your deductions. They don't care about it as much as, let's say, tax credits or other deductions that um, aren't related to timing. Yeah, in in our experience, I, I mean, overall, I think the audit rate is less than one percent, uh, and so. But we've had I'm, I'm I'm racking my brain here trying to think if any of our clients have been audited after doing any of these things, and I I want to say the answer is no. I'd have to go back and look to be sure, but. If, I mean, if, if, and if the answer is yes, it doesn't stick out in my, stick out in my head, so it couldn't have been too painful. Uh, but like you said, in, in other areas of just you know, basic, basic tax positions, I've found in our experience with the IRS that as long as you have the documentation and as long as what you're doing is reasonable and consistent, we just don't have any problems. So to answer that question, I would say I, I've never seen a higher risk of IRS audit. I've never heard of it. a higher risk of IRS audit um, from all of, I, I talk to partners in a bunch of accounting firms all over the country. I've never heard of a higher, higher risk of IRS audit. And in my experience of IRS audits, like I said, as long as you're reasonable and consistent, we've, we generally don't have any problems. Thank you once again for joining us for this presentation produced by McConley and Asbury. We hope you join us for our upcoming events. You can stay up to date with news and learn more about our upcoming events by visiting us at www.macpas.com. Thanks again, and have a great day.